So thank you. I want to make the case for a simple proposition that faith, hope, and politics belong together in the same sentence. I want to present a vision of politics that offers hope, not only for personal reassurance at the end of this contentious, disappointing, and stressful election campaign, but one that equips us for what we face, both individually and as the body of Christ, so that we can think well about the purposes of politics and government and act accordingly. I'd like to begin with a few observations about the 2016 campaign and the context in which it has been fought out. The United States is a diverse society, but you know we struggle to give that diversity political expression. Even in a year like 2016, which has torn up more conventional wisdom than any other election season I've witnessed, the range of political offerings was notably broad at the outset. Libertarian, populist, Democrat, Republican, progressive, and green options were all on the table at the beginning. The range and the scope of these is probably worth pausing to acknowledge. Now, these offerings shrank rapidly through the primary season, but not in a conventional way. On the Democratic side, Senator Sanders' progressive populism drew wide support, and it pulled the party left, and its eventual nominee was pulled to the left. On the Republican side, a more traditional populism rejected the party establishment and nominated a candidate who has continued to hold that establishment at arm's length, so much so that it seemed all but certain until the last week that this approach would take a divided Republican Party down to defeat, and it may still do that. So we've not ended up with the same old, same old. In that sense, we might conclude that our more diverse society made some of its voices heard. Now, we may not like all of those voices, but if we aspire to a genuinely pluralistic society, I think we need to do our best to listen. Uh, more on that point later. Trump and Sanders notwithstanding, however, our society has a very uncertain, a bifurcated vision of the purposes of politics and government. We just can't seem to anchor our social diversity in a vision of the political order as seats around the table where everyone, everyone gets to speak. Instead, we may start out with multiple visions, but then they rapidly dwindle to two, and those two seem locked in increasingly mortal combat. Protest this, and someone will soon offer a justification. You can bring your chair to the table. Nobody's stopping you. There's no law against it. If you want to organize a third party, go ahead. And that's right. But the laws that permit minor parties in the United States are, in fact, of little help. Gary Johnson tried. Dr. Jill Stein tried. But there were so many strikes against them from the beginning. The Commission on Presidential Debates for example, decided that, I quote, candidates must appear on a sufficient number of state ballots to have a mathematical chance of winning a majority in the Electoral College and have a level of support at least 15% of the national electorate as determined by five selected national public opinion polling organizations using the average of those organizations' most recently publicly reported results at the time of the determination. And so, neither of these two minor party representatives even made it to the debates. And in the latest tracking polls, their combined score was hovering just under 7%, down at least 10 points from where they stood when the campaign began in earnest earlier this fall. But this doesn't mean that social diversity is an illusion. It's not. It's a solid fact of American life. And because it is, we have to ask ourselves, how to craft a political space for diversity in our political life that at the moment remains dominated by an antiquated two-party system and pervaded by zero-sum partisan combat. Even as we wrestle with this very difficult task, 
fashioning a representative democracy that holds up a mirror to the diversity of society? We have to confront an even more uncomfortable reality. Now, I'll let Kevin Dendulk of Calvin College deliver the bad news from an article he wrote for the most recent edition of Comment Magazine. It would be a small comfort, he writes, if partisanship were limited to the political sphere. We get angry with the political opposition, get some catharsis in the voting booth, and then we get along when the election is over. But polarization doesn't work that way. We tend to use partisan attachments to make an entire range of choices well beyond conventional politics. Housing choices, media consumption are increasingly correlated with partisan leanings. Partisan intermarriage is quite rare. It may even affect where and with whom we worship. But is that a great surprise? The so-called God gap in American politics isn't merely a description of how religion shapes our choices of candidates and parties. The direction of influence can go the other way. That is, to how political identity shapes our lived experience of the faith. The Society of Human Resource Management agrees with Dendulk. They reported just the other day that the 2016 campaign has spilled over into the workplace, straining relationships, threatening effectiveness, and putting workplace harmony at risk into the future. PBS, too, recently reported that a majority of Americans, I think it was 52 percent, are suffering stress this election season. And for about a year now, the Pew Forum has been confirming that polarization isn't just something that takes place in the Congress, but now describes the general public as well. Let's be realistic. When a campaign like the present one is pervaded by combat imagery, where supporters of one candidate chant, lock her up, about the other, and a polarized atmosphere only enhances this zero-sum feel of the alternatives, it is very hard to resist the temptation to read politics through polarized lenses. But if Dendulk is right, it's even more urgent that we confront the danger of reading our friends' and neighbors' choices their other choices through partisan lenses. Well, if that's the bad news, I do have good news. A more truthful vision for politics exists. I insist on it. It is only too easy to see your political opponents as enemies. Some of you may recall, many of you may recall from the movies, the Lord of the Rings movies, that this is what Faramir does when he captures Frodo and Sam as they're trying to make their way to Mordor to destroy the Ring of Power. Faramir looks at these two little hobbits, the Ring Bearer and Sam Gamgee, and he assumes Sam has to be there in some sort of military defensive capacity. What are you, he asks with a bit of a smirk, his bodyguard? And Sam's answer, which Sean Astin deploys in the unmistakable accents of Southwest England, where I grew up, punctuates an important moment in the film and gives me an introduction to this biblical view of politics and government. I'm Ms. Gardner. Politics is, in biblical perspective, much less like warfare and much more like gardening. Let me explain. As theologian N.T. Wright observes, Human beings bear God's image for a particular purpose, to reflect the wisdom of all creation back to the Creator, and by that same means, to reflect the wise sovereignty of the Creator into the world. Human beings worshiping their Creator were thus the intended key to the proper flourishing of the world. Those who do this are formed by this activity, to become the generous, humble stewards through whom God's creative and sustaining love is let loose into the world. What does generous, humble stewardship look like in the political arena? The Center for Public Justice puts it this way. The principle of public justice recognizes that much of what contributes to human flourishing is not the task of government. This limits the scope of government's work to promoting policies and practices that uphold the ability of other institutions and associations to make their full contributions 
to human flourishing. The principle of public justice also recognizes that much of what contributes to human flourishing is government's task. Government is authorized by God to promote what is good for human flourishing. This is often referred to as securing the common good, promoting the well-being of an entire society in right relationship with the larger world that God made. As part of this, government is also the institution authorized to restrain sin through law and provide lawful retribution for, for, excuse me, for injustice. Now, these references to human flourishing and the common good position government as one human institution, among many, charged with the task of stewardship, of tending and caring for human well-being. Government emerges here as neither more nor less important than families, business firms, charities, schools, hospitals, churches. In a real way, government's task is a humble one, or as one American president put it, most of the time, government should not provide direct help, but should be helping the helpers. In this vision of politics and government, families, business firms, charities, schools, hospitals, churches, and yes, governments, together cultivate the created order. You're catching all the gardening metaphors, yes? When we look back to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28, to understand the human task of stewardship, or when we look forward to the regained creation, what we're doing is linking politics and governing with our hope, that is, with Jesus Christ. Jesus is the most important interpreter of the means and the ends and the true character of politics. The scriptures describe Jesus as the rightful king, in whom God has invested, remember, all power and authority in heaven and earth. So when the Roman authorities executed Jesus, his dying represented the truest exercise of power. Of course, we've always understood Jesus' death as a powerful act, especially in those common Christian declarations. Jesus died for my sins. We're redeemed by his blood. Christ's sacrifice accomplishes nothing less than this, and some churches declare it from their rooftops. Whoops, that's what I wanted. Some churches declare this from their rooftops. But we're a bit slower to recognize, aren't we, that the cross accomplishes much more than this. The scale of it, the scope of it is much greater. Jesus was executed by Caesar's representatives under Caesar's authority. And Rome dealt with those it considered hostile with dispatch. Crucifixions were common and public and designed to humiliate, to emphasize that the leader or movement that had defied Rome was finished. You'll probably recall that Pontius Pilate refused to change the inscription fixed to the cross above Jesus' head, the King of the Jews. He wouldn't allow the Jewish leaders to dismiss Jesus as a crackpot with personal delusions and thus to distance themselves from him. To Pilate, the inscription was perfect and along with the method of execution made his point with unmistakable emphasis, here's your king. Scripture doesn't record that the Roman soldiers who supervised the crucifixion reported to Pilate Jesus, excuse me, Jesus' final words. You remember, it is finished. But if they did, there's no reason to suppose Pilate would have heard those words with anything but satisfaction. That's what he wanted to hear. That's what he wanted publicly demonstrated. Now, of course, it was Pilate's world that was turned upside down. But do most of us simply miss the political import of what happened? The cross was not a hiccup, a temporary setback, on the way to Jesus resuming his divine power and authority at the end of the age. No, it was and it is the truest exercise of that power. This, if you like, is what real kingly power is. Political sovereignty is judged by King Jesus, if you like, not the other way around. Every Caesar, whether in a dictatorship or a democracy, comes under its judgment because the cross does turn politics and government 
on their heads. Calvary is profoundly political. It disconnects power from coercion and force from that battle of wills that forces some to yield and others prevail. And instead, it connects power to what we know by the language of love. This is the power made perfect in weakness. No wonder we struggle. No wonder I struggle to comprehend it. But this vision of politics I'm inviting you to embrace is one that's brought to life by our hope in Christ. For that, we need to exercise faith. By faith, we know that Christ's kingdom endures. It's worth pausing to remind ourselves that the kingdom of God is not derailed by the outcome of a presidential election, or for that matter, the appointment of a judge to the United States Supreme Court. Of course, it follows that the Christian perspective on the purposes of politics and government is not just for personal edification, for reassurance at times of stress, like at the end of this highly contentious presidential campaign, though it's surely valuable in that sense. No, it carries over into political engagement. It equips us for political engagement. In the balance of my time, I, I want to suggest something of the transformative potential of what we may now reliably refer to by the title politics as love. Politics as love is well suited to address some of the more demanding challenges that tax our political and social resources. Let me illustrate that with two contemporary examples. Both of them are what I think of as slow motion catastrophes. They've been with us for some time already. They're becoming semi-permanent features of our world. Both feature dislocation. The one is global in its reach. The other is part of our American agony. The first example is the growing number of the displaced. One in every 113 people on Earth, by a recent estimate from the United Nations High Commission on Refugees. People who are refugees, migrants, or asylum seekers. Who even today are fle fleeing Mosul, Iraq, and fleeing Syria, and so on. Doesn't justice require that we urge our leaders to resist vigorously the fear-mongering that converts refugees into terrorists and try to think imaginatively about how we're going to set up our churches as tents in the mobile lives of the displaced? I don't know what else is capable of transcending the cultural attitudes we have inherited. You know, the ones that say, hey, this is my place, I'm not sure about opening up to just anyone in order to cultivate a very different way of living with others. But if we look to the faith, we'll find that it supplies us with important resources. There is, first of all, the very deep down Christian reality that all of us are sojourners, resident aliens. This is the actual status that fits us for responding to a crisis that is becoming the lived experience of a larger and larger percentage of our neighbors. But when I look at descriptions of the early church, I'm struck by how well its outlook and its ethos fit this lived experience. Christians, observed the philosopher Tertullian in around the year of AD 200, are not distinguished from the rest of mankind by country or language or customs. While they live in cities, both Greek and Oriental, and follow the customs of the country, they display the remarkable and confessedly surprising status of their own citizenship. They live in countries of their own as sojourners. They share all things as citizens. They suffer all things as foreigners. They pass their lives on earth, but they're citizens of heaven. Sometimes, you know, the sources of the wisdom, the empathy, the patience, the suffering, and the prudence that the growing numbers of the displaced call for, these resources lie much closer at hand than we recognize. There is much more to say that could be said about this, of course. But let me move to my second example, which comes a bit closer to home. This second example of a slow motion catastrophe refers to the gradual erosion of what sociologist Charles Murray a few years ago called the founding virtues, marriage, industriousness, honesty, religiosity. 
that he found to have all but disappeared from the bottom 30% on the income scale. The situation he warned just a few years back is so dire, I'm quoting him, it calls into question the viability of working class communities as a place for socializing the next generation. Murray is something of a libertarian who tells his story from the right of center. Fellow sociologist Robert Putnam tells the same story from the center left. In his 2015 book, Our Kids, Putnam describes communities once diverse in wealth, but not divided by it, with internal tensions, but still recognizably cohesive. Places where anyone's children were, up to a point, everyone's children, the our kids of the title. Communities that are now divided along lines of wealth and status and neighborhoods, and as an inevitable result, are divided as to their access to opportunity. The story Putnam tells is one that cries out for this biblical vision of humble stewardship. Recall the Center for Public Justice way of putting it, government and civil society in fruitful relationship to serve the common good. What's gone wrong as Putnam unfolds his tale of collapse from the time he graduated 1959 to the present? What's gone wrong indicts all of the agencies of civil society. Personal choices are implicated, government programs, family arrangements, the decisions of city planners, private developers, to say nothing of a whole range of employers and the decisions they've made and the way the media portrays it all. It's a story of the weakening of the ties that bind, the coming apart of a once more cohesive society. Listen to him for a moment. Ultimately, he writes, Growing class segregation across neighborhoods, schools, marriages, civic associations, workplaces, and friendship circles means that rich Americans and poor Americans are living, learning, and raising children in increasingly separate and unequal worlds, removing the stepping stones to upward mobility. College-going classmates or cousins or middle-class neighbors who might take a working-class kid from the neighborhood under their wing. Moreover, class segregation means that members of the upper middle class are less likely to have first-hand knowledge of the lives of the poor kids and are thus unable even to recognize the growing opportunity back gap. Kevin Dendalk picks up the theme of a society more diverse than ever, but more divided than ever, divided by ignorance and as a result vulnerable to the power of partisanship. Writing about 2016, he says, we're now heading into an uncertain era of intensifying division, reinforced by new opportunities to organize our lives so that we rarely have any meaningful interaction with people who don't share our commitments, the polarization partisanship effect. The rhetoric of the current election strikes me as a clanging alarm bell, he writes, an alarm bell of polarization 21st century style. It is possible, of course, that a few days from now, large numbers of our fellow citizens, disaffected by economic disintegration and social collapse that Putnam describes, will flex their political muscle in ways they don't usually. Their voter turnout levels are not high as a rule. An elected candidate who has engaged their frustrations. Of course, their rage at their circumstances doesn't transform the candidate they have tapped, who has tapped into those frustrations into an imaginative leader with constructive plans for moving forward. But nor does it justify the dismissal of these fellow citizens as merely angry populists. I think representative democracy is pretty empty if it can't represent working class citizens and if it can't absorb a degree of anger. It's pretty empty if all it can do is elect representatives and parties that offer condescension, either of the handout kind or the pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind. I think what these disaffected segments of society need is to have that seat at the table and organized political presence. It seems that Mr. Trump, building on several decades of mass marketing conservatism via Rush and Fox and the rest, got himself heard as the one elite who chastised other elites for not listening. Trump made the connections to blue-collar citizens like these, but he served chiefly as a lightning rod for frustration. The plans 
the policy commitments are thin and they fall short of the kind of imaginative leadership that is needed. It is as if we live on an archipelago, not a continent. Putnam, Murray, and the rest describe communities and a society that are internally balkanized by wealth and by our choices, so that it becomes less and less accurate to speak of neighborhoods or even having neighbors. If we live in islands of sameness, why would we be surprised that we don't know how to have a conversation with those on other islands? I thought about this recently as reading, reading some work by J.D. Vance, who grew up in the former steelmaking community of Middletown, Ohio, amidst family breakdown, departed jobs, drug abuse, and many another challenge that he describes in his work, Hillbilly Elegy. But he made his way to Yale Law School and eventually to Silicon Valley. He remarks that the latter is the most optimistic place he's ever encountered. But at the same time, almost nobody in his new workplace has any conception of what it's like to live in the deep pessimism in which he grew up because they don't know and don't interact with anyone from a setting like that. Bridging these gaps won't be easy. After all, the story that Robert Putnam tells of gradual collapse took, takes place over about five or more decades. So it won't be fixed in five minutes. But the real diversity conversations, I think, have to begin out here. What will be needed are the sort of virtues that the scriptures refer to as fruits of the spirit. There's the gardening metaphor again. You're familiar with them. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I want to keep insisting that these fruits are not just, well, nice, but have extraordinary utility. And we're going to have to draw on their sustenance to undertake the tasks of building genuinely diverse communities and teaching the norms of a principled pluralism, which I think may be the only way to hear and respect deep differences. We can't hope to practice this in our politics if we don't figure out how to practice it out here in society, in our communities. I don't think we're close yet, and I appeal to the 2016 campaign rhetoric as evidence. But this is just the kind of undertaking that constitutes the cultivation of culture that the reform tradition knows as a divine mandate, that is, a command from God. One of my colleagues observed the other day that if we're talking, when we were talking about the polarization inside the political process, that we can't expect the process to be better than we are. When thinking about how to confront a slow motion catastrophe of dislocation and division unfolding in our culture, it's pretty clear we can't look to the political process to plaster over the cracks and devise the real solutions. It's here that the issues need to be addressed, here in our communities. And it's here that the humble stewardship N.T. Wright speaks of and the doing of public justice that the CPJ articulates can bring real resources to bear. As I noted earlier, Jesus did not just die for our sins. As Wright puts it, the good news is not only that God is sorting out the world, there's a Britishism for you, but that his rule is a different kind of rule entirely from those that give monarchs a bad name. When God is faced with the corruption of monarchy, he promises not to abolish it, but to send a true king to rule with utter justice making the poor and needy his constant priority. The human vocation to share that rule, that task, is framed within the true justice and mercy of God himself. Any of us, by the shape and direction of our own lives under God, our vocations, no less, bring not just biblical perspective into our communities and workplaces and circles of friends, but we can bring, bring biblical best practices too. If politics as love transforms our understanding of true power, then we can decide by the careers we take up, the friends we keep, the churches in which we worship, the neighborhoods we choose to settle in, to find ways to bridge the divide and in so doing tackle at least some of the root causes of our diverse but divided society. 
Now, I know that opportunity beckons in Boston and New York and Washington, D.C. and Silicon Valley and the rest. But great swaths of rural America, what used to be called a bit derisively the flyover states, could benefit from that kind of obedient Christian service as well. To sum up, a biblical vision for the nature and purpose of politics offers us a robust set of resources, fruits of the Spirit even, for tackling the problems and pathologies of our diverse but divided culture, problems that pervade the poisonous atmosphere of this year's presidential election. And I want to turn back in closing to these looming elections by offering two or three bits and pieces of advice if you're willing to take them from somebody who as a resident alien can't vote in the election and because he's lived outside his own country for a long time can't vote there either. First, leaven the rhetoric at the top of the ticket by reading the party platforms. The platforms are not a precise plan of action, but the victorious party will try to implement their platform, even if the election result gives us divided government again. That is, that the party that wins the White House doesn't win at least one of the houses of Congress. Whether or not you feel able to vote for the presidential nominee, deciding which party platform comes closer to the direction you want the country to follow will leave you more informed and with a sense of the direction the two parties wish to take the country. If you read the Republican platform, you'll recognize much that's in it. It strikes a patriotic note. And on that note, projects anxiety about the future because it ties that anxiety to the possibility that the Democrats should continue to hold the White House and continue the policies of the Obama administration to which they're opposed, of course. Many of the positions the Republican platform supports are simple reversals of current administration policy. For example, it pledges repeal of the Dodd-Frank law of 2010, which, expand, which expands regulation of financial institutions and extends consumer protection. It urges restoring the work requirements for receiving welfare under the 1996 law that has been weakened by the Obama administration. On education, it seeks a broad expansion of school choice. On healthcare, predictably, it seeks to repeal the Affo Affordable Care Act and supports a variety of other actions to expand citizen choice in healthcare. It supports the defederalization of our criminal justice system. It rejects a path to citizenship for those here illegally. And of course, notoriously, it pledges construction of a border wall across the southern border of the United States. But the reader will quickly recognize a common theme across all of this. Individual freedom. Republicans regret the shrinking of choice that they find in the actions of the current administration, and they pledge to restore and expand people's choices as they see them. The Democratic platform lacks the sense of grand drama that pervades the Republican one. In its place, the party supports all the major initiatives of the last eight years under a Democratic president, including its foreign policy. But one theme stands out. If the Republicans are pledged to expanding personal choice and shrinking the regulatory reach of government, the Democrats match those commitments with their determination to end inequality by wielding the power of government to expand funding for public education, revising the tax law to benefit those with lower incomes. For example, the earned income tax credit that benefits low income wage earners is to undergo a broad expansion under the Democrats, and by raising the minimum wage. It's a bit more of a detailed platform than the Republican one, but many of the commitments it contains are simply pledges to act, not plans for taking the action. The platforms represent quite a bit of continuity with the policy commitments of both parties. Their commitments over the past several decades are on display. In fact, in contrast to the volatile character of the campaign itself, the platforms are striking up to a point for being familiar more than they're radical. Here and there it's true, the campaigns intrude. Donald Trump's pledge to build a wall turns the party's opposition to legal immigration into an absolute. And his skepticism towards free trade marks a profound departure from many years of Republican commitments. On the Democratic side, 
Bernie Sanders' insistence on free tuition for community college has made its way into the platform, but it really falls into the pledge, not plan, category. My humble suggestion is this, that the platforms offer some useful guidance for the likely course a new administration might follow. Guidance that may be better than listening to the candidates attacking each other's character, attacks that both have invited by their own actions. Perhaps this is still not enough to overcome your reluctance, perhaps to support one of them, but the party platforms are not just symbolic, they offer an appropriate corrective, a counterweight to the highly personalized flavor of campaign politics and media coverage of campaign politics. It makes sense to read the platforms as you consider contests up and down the ballot, and that, of course, is something else you can do. Consider the congressional and Senate races. Study the candidates who want to fill those offices. Consider and vote on the ballot questions if your state has some. Those are very important because your power there is direct lawmaking power. And vote your conscience. There's no such thing as a wasted ballot if it expresses a genuine commitment even to a candidate unlikely to win that you decide to write, excuse me, to decide to write in. Withhold your vote from someone who doesn't deserve it, but do participate. I think the only wasted ballot is one that isn't cast at all. And last, remember that you take your bearings in all this from the crucified Jesus, Christ the King, who calls us to reflect the image of God to our communities in the form of humble, generous stewardship. Politics is part of that stewardship, Politics, too, is tending the garden. Faith, hope, and politics, yes, they do belong in the same sentence. Thank you. And you are dismissed.